uh, Concordia University and McGill University and is a past chairman of the board of the Canadian Centre for Ecumenism. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation and uh, Bishop Dowd's um, presentation is on Vatican II and ecumenism. I see they're making you work. There isn't even a break from one speaker to another. So I, I hope that we can, uh, I'll be able to present this in a way that keeps our attention. I wish to apologize, first of all, to the people doing the translation. I know that it's handy to have a text in front of you and you do not have one. So I will attempt to speak slowly to make it, yes, thank you. I will attempt to speak slowly to make this easy. Uh, aussi, uh, pour ceux qui écoutent avec les écouteurs, uh, la traduction en français, je m'excuse, mais je vais essayer de parler lentement pour aider uh, les personnes qui fassent la traduction. My topic is Vatican II and ecumenism. Why this topic? Well, first of all, Vatican II, the Second Vatican Council, occurred from 1962 to 1965, which means that we are in a period of celebrating the 50 years, 50th anniversary of that council. And it turns out that the key document on ecumenism coming from the Roman Catholic Church, which really allowed the church to turn the page, to turn a corner in ecumenism, was issued in November of 1964. This is 2014. We're coming up on the 50th anniversary of that very specific document. So for an institute like this, it is very apropos that we explore what Vatican II actually had to say, given that this particular approach, this was a new approach within the Roman Catholic Church and it marked a, a significant turning point, not just for the Roman Catholic Church, but for the ecumenical movement in general. So there is a, a very objective reason why this is a topic worth addressing at this institute. I also have a personal reason why I wanted to speak on this topic, and that is my own interest in ecumenism. As uh, Dr. Barra said, I am a former uh, chairman of the board of the Canadian Center for Ecumenism. Prior to that, I was a director on the board. And in the days when the center was located in the Grand Seminaire de Montréal, while I was a student there, I used to go to the center all the time. I think I was the mascot for the center at the time. <laughs> and so I have a love for the center, but also a love for the ecumenical movement. You know, after Vatican II, uh, there were a lot of documents that were published. I have here a book. You can see it's relatively thick, and these are the documents of Vatican II and other documents that helped implement it. That was a lot to absorb in the church in the space of a few years. And as a high school student going through Catholic school, very often our teachers would present the council, and some would say Vatican II said this, and others would say Vatican II said that, and what they said contradicted each other. Couldn't possibly be saying both. And so who did I ask about what Vatican II really said? I asked my mother. Because it turns out my mother studied theology in the 1960s in Germany. And so she had access to many of the theologians who had worked directly on the documents of Vatican II. I knew she knew this very closely. And so I asked her, what did Vatican II actually say? And so what did she do? She went to the bookshelf, pulled this very copy of the documents of Vatican II, and handed it to me and said, if you want to find out what the council said, actually what she said was, if you want to see the action of the Holy Spirit in the church, read the documents. Well, I was hooked. Who doesn't want to see the action of the Holy Spirit? So I, I got this book. I will admit it took me a few years to get through it, but I was about 14 when she passed it to me, so I think I have a, a good excuse. But I, I got through everything. You can see my copy is missing the cover. Actually, it's not missing the cover. It just came off, and it's in the middle of the text now. 
But uh, for me, this is a holy book. Uh, this is a witness to the action of the Holy Spirit in the church. And one of the texts that I found particularly inspirational, you know, whenever you read a, a document that contains texts from multiple authors, there are some that will grab you more than others. Or at different times in your life, as you reread it, you may discover something new. But the text that really grabbed me was the one on ecumenism because it spoke about something very dear to my heart, which is the mission of unity. The idea that we have to see each other and can see each other as brothers and sisters. The idea that we should work together to build unity and that the church for the world can be a sign, I'd even say a sacrament of unity that spoke to me. There's enough disunity in our world. And so to know that part of the movement of the Holy Spirit, part of what God was asking of the church was this movement towards unity, that spoke to me a great deal. When I was studying to be a priest, as I said, uh, at the seminary, the ecumenical center was located in the same building. And so I used to spend a lot of time there, and that helped me also in my own private time to meditate a lot on the movement, the ecumenical movement. And I realized that it can't be just a matter of the head. It also needs to be a matter of the heart. So on my own time, as a personal initiative, I developed a little prayer book, which I called the Office for Christian Unity. This, by the way, is the only copy in the world. Okay, it's never been published or anything like that. Uh, I'm, I'm one of those terrible perfectionists. You'll, you'll pry this out of my hands after I'm dead, probably. You know, I just will hang on to it. But this is a prayer book that I developed so that in my own prayer life and routines, I could integrate prayer for unity and meditation on unity into, as I say, my prayer life. Division in the church is not something that flows from the will of God. In other words, division in the church, on some level, is rooted in sin. But in the text, Vatican II, the Council says that although these divisions occurred, these separations occurred, that people from both sides were to blame. In other words, it takes, you know, two to tango, and so it is a recognition that you know the old saying, if you point your finger at somebody else, you've got a whole bunch pointing back at you? There's a recognition that the whole question of disunity has to be seen as a, a common responsibility, you might say, in the sense that we're all responsible. We all have a part to play, and we need to accept that, whether it's our own personal responsibility or the responsibility of our ancestors in the faith, regardless of what it is, we have to have the humility to acknowledge that. It's too easy when there are conflicts to simply point the finger at the other and say the other is to blame. The council is saying let's start by recognizing our mutual responsibility for the divisions which exist. A call to humility and fundamentally to repentance. Beyond that, however, the council in this same element of the document goes on to say that elements of grace, we have to also acknowledge that elements of grace are found in the other churches, the ones different from our own. And that those elements of grace can even be elements sufficient to lead to salvation. The question of salvation, I mean, put bluntly, who gets to heaven, although it's not quite as, as simple as that, but that is obviously at the heart of the Christian message. I mean, Jesus is the Savior. Well, saves us from what? What is the nature of that salvation? That's at the heart of our understanding of who Jesus is and what his mission was all about. To come out very bluntly and say that there are elements of salvation 
For example, the passage, these liturgical actions must be regarded as capable of giving access to the community of salvation. You know, there's an old slogan, a theological slogan that exists, no salvation outside the church. Well, if you're saying that somebody else has something which allows access to salvation, what you're saying is, in some ways, it's not that we're the church and they're not, it's we're all the church. We may not have perfect communion among ourselves, but there's a recognition of one's own reality in the other. I believe that at the current juncture we're in theologically, in terms of the evolution, ongoing evolution of dogmatic theology, the question of salvation is at really at the heart of so many other elements of theology. It's at the heart of moral theology. It's at the heart of missionary theology. It's at the heart of what it means to pray and what prayer is all about, sacramental theology. Behind it all is the question, what's the point? So what? I think that's the question a lot of young people are asking. You know, we, we can give religious instruction. That's very nice. We give lots of data. But the question that we often get is, so what? What difference does it make? And so that's the question of salvation. That's the question of hope. And ecumenism is tied to that. Ecumenism has something to say in the answers that we as Christians, regardless of our particular stripes, that we are going to have to offer. So the issue of salvation and the issue of humility, the issue of repentance, very important themes from the document, the decree on ecumenism. And then we come to what I love is, uh, you know, for me, the, the passage that I have a particular draw towards. And this is the definition of the ecumenical movement according to Vatican II. What is this thing called the ecumenical movement? But also, what is the promise that it holds? Remember, part of this idea is that ecumenism is part of a movement of the Spirit. So what is the Holy Spirit promising? What is his dream for the ecumenical movement? So this is an extended quote. The term ecumenical movement indicates the initiatives and activities planned and undertaken according to the various needs of the church and as opportunities offer to promote Christian unity. That's a summary. Anything that promotes Christian unity. Then it goes on to spell out some very practical elements. There are five. First, every effort to avoid expressions judgments and actions which do not represent the condition of our separated brethren with truth and fairness and so make mutual relations with them more difficult. In other words, do not bear false witness against your neighbor. Rule number one, if you're going to speak, for example, about the faith and the traditions of another church different from your own, Make sure what you're saying is accurate and avoid the snide comments and avoid the little jokes and avoid the, oh, we're better than them and all those kinds of attitudes. It starts with avoiding expressions, judgments, and actions which do not represent them with truth and fairness. I find that interesting. The very first thing to do, again, is tied to that examination of conscience that examination of one's own attitudes, and the humility to recognize that maybe we don't understand our neighbor as well as we thought. For me, the gold standard for this is if I can describe my neighbor's faith in a way that my neighbor recognizes themselves in it. You know, they say, well, I know you're a Roman Catholic bishop, but boy, the way you describe what it's like to be a Presbyterian is really dead on. Um, okay, that's terrific. It means that I have understood it. I may not agree, but the first step is to make sure that I can represent it with truth and fairness. So that's step number one. Step number two, dialogue between competent experts from different churches and communities 
At these meetings, which are organized in a religious spirit, each explains the teaching of his communion in greater depth and brings out clearly its distinctive features. In such dialogue, everyone gains a truer knowledge and more just appreciation of the teaching and religious life of both communions. Bringing together those in the know. Ecumenism is not uh, a peace summit where we're negotiating differences to kind of come to a mushy middle. It's about people of integrity acting as ambassadors for their own faith tradition, but knowledgeable ambassadors, and in a religious spirit, as it says, not just in a, a purely intellectual exercise. You know, theology is something we should do on our knees. It should be brought into our prayer life. And so to bring it with a spirit of prayer, bring it with a religious spirit for each to present with pride their own tradition and allow the other, in a sense, to fall in love with the positive features that are found there. For me and, and for the text, that's the second major step. Now that dialogue, as it says, is fundamentally between experts because you need to have the background knowledge and we know not everybody has that. But if the experts aren't as expert as they should be, that will have trickle-down effects in the whole communion, which isn't very positive either. So there's a special responsibility here for theologians. Those of you who are studying theology, take note. Those of you who are professors of theology, take note. There is a special responsibility here. The third point. The way is prepared for cooperation between churches in the duties for the common good of humanity which are demanded by every Christian conscience. In other words, where the churches can agree in their moral understanding for action that promotes the law of love, love of God and particularly love of neighbor, the common good of humanity, then we should do it together. Uh, it's otherwise been formulated as the principle of Lund, which is that it, everything that we can do together, unless our conscience, we have a conflict of conscience between us and we can't agree that something is a common activity, but if we can agree, then we should do it together and we should, as almost as an instinct, find a way to do it together, to work together. And I'm very pleased to say that in Montreal, we have seen many different examples of this. Uh, I was a priest serving in the east end of Montreal, where there is a senior center called Almage, A-L-M-A-G-E, Almage. Where did they come up with that name, Almage? What does that mean? Well, it comes from the names of three churches, St. Aloysius, that's the Al, St. Margaret, that's the Ma, and St. George, that's the GE at the end, Almash. One Roman Catholic, one Anglican, one United, coming together to create a senior center for all of the people of the area. That is this third principle in action. Why not? We need to have many more projects like this. The fourth point, wherever this is allowed, there is prayer in common. It's kind of a funny intro wherever this is allowed, but there is a, a recognition there that there are different sensitivities in different churches to uh, the degrees of prayer which exist. For example, I'm not too sure that the Roman Catholic Rosary Prayer Group is going to invite the local evangelicals to come along and pray to Mary. Uh, it, it would be a nice gesture, and I'm sure you know they'd appreciate the invitation, but we have to understand wherever this is allowed, th there's no point setting ourselves up for a failure, for a fall, you know? And so, but to find those ways, I consider the expression wherever this is allowed not as a restriction, but as an opening to exploration. Let us find the ways where this is allowed, either by crafting new forms of prayer and devotion that can be prayed in common, or by each exploring the tradition of the other. When I was a, a seminarian, there was an Orthodox church not too far from the seminary, sign of the Theotokos. And so it was actually in the basement of a Roman Catholic church. 
and so I used to go there on Saturday nights for Vespers. And they always could tell I was the Roman Catholic because I was the first one to show up. There's something about, I don't know, sign of the Theotokos, people show up late. The Orthodox bishop is laughing. He knows what I'm talking about. Uh, a wonderful experience. Half an hour of prayer, Saturday evening. Uh, I think I became the Roman Catholic member of the Orthodox parish at that point. Got to know the pastor, got to know the choir. But I didn't do much more than just stand there and soak it in. But to be present, a prayer of presence, is already a genuine form of prayer. Can we not do the same? I know of another community that has a small, uh, what they call a prayer visiting team. And it's a Roman Catholic group, so they go to Mass on Saturday night instead of Sunday morning. And then Sunday morning, they go to a local Protestant or Orthodox church just to sit in on the service. They arrange it ahead of time. They don't sort of show up, as they say in French, comme a cheveux sur la soupe. You know, they don't show up as a fly in the ointment. It's, it's planned ahead of time. But nonetheless, uh, and they're always very well received, very well received. People are delighted to receive guests and to share their tradition and to know that there is prayer in common. Now, the fifth point from this section, I said there were five. All are led to examine their own faithfulness to Christ's will for the church and accordingly to undertake with vigor the task of renewal and reform. The idea is that the church is always a work in progress. Well, frankly, every Christian is always a work in progress, and so the body of Christians will be a work in progress. As we accept that, and as we work for renewing our own church, if we are in contact with other churches, we're going to see, boy, you know, the evangelicals, they do that really well. Maybe we can learn from them. And the successes of other churches become part of our own effort for renewal in our own. There's going to be a workshop this November, a, a conference in the Roman Catholic Church here in Montreal, called the Parish Vitality Conference. It's to help boost our local parish communities. And of the, two, of the many workshops, two of them are being offered by Christian Direction. Christian Direction is the local alliance, you might say, of evangelical missiologists. And we've asked them to help us for two specific areas, how to get to know your community, how to be connected to your community, and also how to have communities that are hospitable and welcoming. Because if there's two things they're really good at, it's those two things. And very generously, they've accepted to help us with that. We're learning from them for the sake of the renewal and reform of the Roman Catholic approach to these things, but with the help of the other. Now here's the promise behind this. And this is for me the line that stands out the most. When such actions are undertaken prudently and patiently, they promote justice and truth, concord and collaboration, as well as the spirit of brotherly love and unity. This is the way that when the obstacles to perfect ecclesiastical communion have been gradually overcome, all Christians will at last in a common celebration of the Eucharist, be gathered into the one and only church in that unity which Christ bestowed on his church from the beginning. That's the summit of unity, to be able to worship together around the common altar, around the common Eucharist, so that the way we pray is the way we live, and the way we live is the way we pray. And, and Vatican II is promising that these five things will serve as a roadmap towards that. That's powerful. You know, unity is a tricky thing. Disunity is a lot easier than unity. How do we build it? How do we maintain it? How do we strengthen it? Five things, five counsels, recommendations, initiatives, whatever you want to call them, that I believe the Holy Spirit is promising to the church, to all of us, as a path to follow. Some people say we are in a, a winter of ecumenism, a time of ecumenism when 
things, you know, don't seem to be going so well, uh, what's happening with ecumenism, the, the fervor of the ecumenical movement, especially in the 60s and 70s, seems to die down. Maybe it's just a time of refocusing. I submit to you these five points can serve as points of reference for that refocusing. Behind all of this is, I believe, the deep need to make sure that ecumenism does not remain simply an intellectual exercise or uh, simply uh, an organizational exercise, almost like a political exercise. The decree on ecumenism from the Second Vatican Council also says, there can be no ecumenism worthy of the name without a change of heart. It's a matter of the heart. It is from renewal of the inner life of our minds. The word in Latin can also be translated as soul. The inner life from self-denial and an untainted love that desires of unity take their rise and develop in a mature way. We should pray to the Holy Spirit for the grace to be genuinely self-denying humble, gentle in the service of others, and to have an attitude of brotherly generosity towards them. And then there's a beautiful quote from St. Paul. I, a prisoner for the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called with all humility and meekness, with patience, forbearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. And it goes on to say that this change of heart and holiness of life, along with public and private prayer for the unity of Christians, should be regarded as the soul of the whole ecumenical movement and merits the name spiritual ecumenism. It starts with us and with us being open, recognizing that there is a supernatural component to this quest for unity. And we shouldn't say that thinking that once we've called it supernatural, it means we have nothing to do. We have a lot of work to do. I mean, those five points I mentioned earlier, that's a huge amount of work to do. But we also should not fall into the trap of forgetting the grace of God. You know, it's salvation through grace, not through works, right? There's the works we gotta do, but we have to be open to the grace and to remember that spiritual ecumenism in our own conversion is very important. I find, just as a bit of a segue, you know, uh, the Roman Catholic Church right now is very blessed to have Pope Francis as its spiritual uh, and ecclesiastical leader throughout the world. And uh, I, I haven't met the guy personally, so I'm just going on impressions that I get. But I'm sure many of us have had the same impression that here is a man who is genuinely self-denying, humble, gentle in the service of others with an attitude of brotherly generosity. I see these features in the man and I also see as a result of that people being drawn towards him. He's like a magnet and not just for people who are, happen to be Roman Catholic. There's a magnetism that's ecumenical. I have. I, I kid you not, I have been stopped in the street. I mean, I, I walk around dressed like this so people can tell I'm a, a priest or a bishop. I don't know if they spot I'm a bishop, but they spot I'm a clergyman at the very least. And I have been stopped in the street by people. The first question, are you Catholic? I say yes. The second point, I just love your pope. He's my pope too. This has happened more than once. This has happened more than once. And so, what can I say? This stuff works. You know, genuinely self-denying, humble, gentle, an attitude of brotherly generosity, living that spirit of St. Paul, living a steep spirit of prayer and communion with God. There's an attractive element. You know, it's one thing for a magnet to attract a piece of metal. You know what's even stronger, though? When two magnets attract each other. Then the bond is even stronger. What if we were all those magnets? Not just letting the Pope be the magnet, but all of us, regardless of our religious affiliation. 
then unity, I, I suspect, would be a lot simpler. So there's a great movement of renewal we have to have in our own hearts, of conversion in our own hearts and in the institutions of the church. Yes, all of those things. But there is a promise behind it, a promise of hope that says that as we live these very practical suggestions, we will grow in a very real unity that will start with small projects and will build to that one common celebration of the Eucharist. I guess to conclude, um, I've given this talk before, you know, uh, and sometimes people say, well, that's very nice, Father. You know, or, oh, that's very nice, Bishop. You know, and I can tell they walk away going, oh, he's young. You know, or, oh, he's an idealist. I don't consider myself an idealist. I'm a person with ideals, but if there's a promise from God, is that not realistic? What can be more realistic from that? I suppose if we don't accept that it's a promise from God, if that's not our premise, then that's a whole other conclusion. But there is a promise of fruitfulness, and to be blunt, I haven't seen a better idea. I haven't seen another plan out there, another program that says something more inspirational. So why don't we start with that? Why don't we start by looking at that? Let's at least give it a try. And then maybe from there, God will surprise us. So I thank you very much for your attention, and I now, I'd be happy to receive your questions. Thank you very much for this uh, inspiring uh, speech. Um, I invite you also to ask questions. You Not all at once, please. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Uh, my question is, uh, do you believe that brotherly unity, such as the attitude and behaviors of, of uh, Pope Francis, uh, are exclusive to the ecumenical Christians and perhaps unattainable outside of Christianity? I don't quite understand. Um, you're talking about that kind of altruistic behavior that Pope Francis has, that people magnetically attract to. Do you think that kind of attitude is unattainable outside of that realm? Outside. Of Christianity. In other words, is it an interfaith question as well yes. as an ecumenical question? Yes. It's an interesting question. I had a meeting last night uh, with a, a local imam. I called him up because of, well, what happened in St. Jean sur Richelieu, and we had met at a conference a few months ago, and so I said, let's get together and talk. And then after we spoke, the incident in Ottawa occurred. And we just took some time to share very openly and honestly uh, to... Uh, you know, express our desire for partnership and mutual collaboration. By the strict definition, that's not ecumenism, but as we can hear in the desire for ecumenism, there, is, uh, there are certain positive human virtues. You know, it's not just religious virtues. There are basic human virtues of, of openness to the other, of mutual honesty, uh, transparency, which I think uh, can be part of it. Um, I don't, I don't know to what extent it's possible to have sort of an ecumenism of all religions, per se, that leads to a common celebration of the Eucharist, as is promised. That really is specific to Christianity. But uh, certainly many of the patterns that are proposed in the ecumenical movement can be reproduced on a, on a broader scale. And I suspect they would also bear fruit. In many cases, they already have, actually. Hi. Uh, you started your talk by saying that uh, we're talking about the decree on ecumenism because it's the 50th anniversary. Um, so I'm kind of curious. Uh, I haven't heard all that much about uh, events planned to mark the 50th anniversary of, of the decree. Um, so I'm, I'm curious because um, you, you mentioned about the is, is there an ecumenical winter and perhaps we're refocusing and uh, so Maybe if you'd like to respond to that. Yeah, sure. The, um, well, the, the, I can only, obviously, because it's a Roman Catholic document, uh, I can speak about initiatives in the Roman Catholic Church. The uh, National Church did produce 
a uh, guidebook and uh, uh, sort of a prayer service suggestion in order to market, as well as study guides for small study groups. Uh, the idea is you don't want to just have kind of the, the one event and then it's done. You want to be able to engage people who like to read, like to study, and have them bringing this into their overall understanding uh, of the faith. But that's not just going to be one incident. That will be stretched out over the course of the year. How each diocese will undertake it is up to each local church to decide. Uh, in Montreal, we're still in the planning stages for how to do that. But if I have my way, it's going to happen. So. But it's not happening in November 2014? No, no. But that's the, we usually use these dates as a kickoff for a process. You know? okay. I can't say on November 9th, the Anglican Roman Catholic Dialogue of Canada is sponsoring a commemoration of the decree on ecumenism at St. James Anglican Cathedral in Toronto. So that's, uh, and we're using the resources produced by the Catholic Church around that. So there'll be a liturgy of the word followed by uh, uh, some talk, so. In some cases yeah. also, they're gonna be sort of joint celebrations. One will be the ecumenical, because there was another document that came out of Vatican II on interfaith questions. Nostra Aetate, especially with regards to relations with the Jews. And so there may be joint commemorations of the two things. So you're all invited to come to Toronto November 9th at 7 o'clock. Woohoo! <laughs> yeah, wrong, wrong city to invite Montrealers to, I guess. Eh? Uh, a question, Bishop Dowd. You spoke uh, eloquently of your own experience as a seminarian, uh, engaging with Christians of other traditions, hanging out at the center when it was in the same building as your seminary. Um, and so much of the reception of the Vatican II documents, including uh, the decree on ecumenism, has to do with the manner in which, uh, in the case of the Catholic Church, priests are formed. How typical would you say your ecumenical experience of your theological and pastoral training was? And do you think that uh, Catholic priests in Montreal or more broadly in Canada are being formed ecumenically in the vision of the decree on ecumenism? That's hard to say outside of Montreal. I don't really have expertise in that. I know that they're supposed to. If you look at the program of priestly formation, there is supposed to be an in-depth uh, study of ecumenism. To be honest, though, it's not really what happens in seminaries. It's what happens after seminary. If you are in an environment where ecumenical dialogue and action is a regular part of the life of the neighborhood, for example, then uh, it becomes just part of your soul. You know, it becomes part of how you do things. If it's not so much that's the way it is, then you may wind up, you know, and then there's always the questions of the leaky church roof and is the furnace working and just the practical day-to-day -day of ordinary local community life that sometimes gets in the way. Although I do think there's something to be said for the ecumenism of leaky church roofs because that is something common to pretty much all the traditions. Uh, I've noticed that when pastors get together, they always talk about, you know, how's your collection and, you know, how's the, uh, how's the roof and do, can you recommend somebody for the furnace? Maybe that's a place to start. I don't know. Um, I know that I have been blessed with ecumenical experiences on the local level as well, so that has perhaps reinforced my vision. When I was a, a parish priest out in Pierrefonds, um, we would you know, engage in a, a local ministerial gathering that met every month or so for lunch and just for sharing and fellowship among us, the various ministers. Um, and, I mean, you can't force anybody to come, so some saw it valuable and others saw it as an imposition. What can you do? Not everyone, uh, not everyone would come. But it was, it was a truly valuable, uh, valuable experience. Um, you learn a lot about each other. I remember driving past the Coptic Orthodox Church nearby. You know, on, a front of a, on the lawn of a Roman Catholic church, you'll often see a sign that says the hours of Mass, you know, when the Sunday Eucharist is. So it'll say Mass 8 and 11. And at the Coptic church, it said Mass 8 to 11. <laughs> That's when I knew it was a very different environment, you know. But, you know, wonderful relations uh, with them. And so I think it, it's something that is part of the formation, but it's part of the ongoing formation. I think a real question is how are we encouraging the groups of ministers to come together on a local level to begin to pray and address the local problems? It's at the local level that we can really succeed. And 
uh, I guess just to follow up with your statement is how do we encourage some some of the local leaders to, to get involved within the ecumenical movement? Like I've noticed that there's some ecum there's some evangelical uh, churches that are that are warm to it and they're into it, and there's some that they're colder than uh, a glacier on the coldest day in the winter. You know, or sorry, bad analogy. I'm tired, <laughs> but. You know, how do we get these? Because I've noticed that there are some people that are interested, but their leaders aren't, so it, it just doesn't go anywhere. Like, how do we sort of light some fires? Well, that's a good question. I mean, part of it, honestly, is serendipity. Uh, when the opportunity strikes, uh, I was a hospital chaplain at one point, and there was a, uh, uh, a family that their son, he was quite young, he was in his early 30s, he was dying of a brain tumor. You know, and so uh, I would, as a hospital chaplain, I would go and visit, and I would show up, introduce myself, and say I'm the Roman Catholic priest. And uh, the the family was Greek Orthodox, but from a, a branch of Greek Orthodoxy that's called the Old Calendarists, and so they tend to be fairly reserved, you know, with regards to I'm I'm trying to be polite here, but fairly reserved in their you know relationship or approach with other religions. But I, I just showed up and said hello, and you know, just through the, the gradual coming along and, and talking with the mother who's going through this wrenching experience of tending to her dying son, who at that point couldn't speak, he didn't, could only communicate by blinking his eyes. Um, you know, towards the end, I got invited to, to go to the funeral, you know, which was an interesting encounter through a family. So that's serendipity. You know, but it's a serendipity that if we're open to the spirit, we can see how we're being led to these kinds of uh, positive encounters. How can we do it? Well, we is a big question, but in the decree on ecumenism, there's another passage I didn't quote earlier, but I'll quote now. Catholics in their ecumenical work must assuredly be concerned for their separated brethren, praying for them, keeping them informed about the church, and making the first approaches toward them. So there are four things that we can do. First of all, a genuine concern, which means knowing what their community is all about. Secondly, praying for them in a sincere prayer. Keeping them informed about what's going on in the Roman Catholic side. I mean, I'm not sure how many of the Roman Catholic parishes send their parish bulletin to the local Anglican church, but it's actually probably not a bad idea and you know, vice versa. And finally, making the first approaches toward them. I believe very strongly in the ecumenism of the church bazaar. You know, when the, we, we laugh, but you know, when the church throws open its doors and saying, please come, maybe just please come and buy stuff, but please come, why not go? I would regularly go to all the church bazaars in my area and it, gets you, it gives you a chance to meet the volunteers and then through them meet the pastor and you know, there's, Practical little things like that serve as those first approaches that break the ice. And uh, if, do, we have, do we have time for one more question? I have no idea. Do we have? Last one, yeah. Last one. Yeah. Sorry, there's no one else. Um, just, well, what do you do, though, with people who they don't necessarily under either, A, don't understand what their own denomination teaches, so they're talking about things that, you know, wait a second here, you're, you're, you're off theologically because you understand theirs. And or what do you do, like, when people are talking, like, you know, with, unfortunately with the whole ecumenicalism is that we have people that either don't know their material or they think they do and they don't, if you get my drift. So how do we sort of engage in this type of dialogue where it's sort of fruitful but yet it doesn't cause uh, friction or potential nini or I call, I call it cat and dog syndrome in a bad way, you know? Like, yeah, I hear you. I mean, this is, I think, one of the reasons why the vision here in Vatican II is part of ecumenism includes the renewal within our own church, and that can be the renewal, for example, in catechism of properly knowing one's own faith tradition. It's hard to share your own when you don't know it. Um, you know, that being said, uh, there's a lot that we can do together nonetheless. Um, not everybody has to be a, a theological expert. You don't have to be a theological expert to come together and pray. You know, you don't have to be a theological expert to get together and feed the poor. If we have a disagreement on whether or not the poor should be fed, well, then we have a whole other problem outside the realm of ecumenism. 
So if we can at least agree on certain basic common actions, that provides the fertile soil in which to continue these explorations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this invitation. Thank you very much.